Good morning, church. For today's message, I'm going to be talking about friendships. I had some slides, but I don't think it's working, but it's okay. Um, What kind of friends we should have, what kind of friends we should not have, and the kind of friends that we should be to other people. Uh, Initially, oh, thank you. Initially, I had uh, planned this sermon right before the school year started, and I thought it would be good. Uh, It's geared towards the children. Uh, Your friendships determine a lot in your life. more than you might know. There's that saying, show me a person's friends and I'll tell you their character. Uh, And then there's a Bible verse, bad company corrupts good morals. Um, And I'll be talking about that a little bit more as I go through. But your friendships determine a lot. Um, But before I get into it, let's say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before your presence, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus, for helping us to come here safely and for helping us, Lord, to worship you so far. I pray, Lord God, as I speak, I pray that you would speak through me, Lord. I pray that you grant me the words to say, Lord Jesus, and I pray for the blessing of the remainder of this service, and I thank you, Lord. And in your name I pray, amen. So let's start with the kind of friends that we should have. We are all either in work or in school or otherwise interact with other people. And when you first interact with someone, there's this process that you go through, whether you do it explicitly or not, of where you're trying to figure out, is this person cool? Do I want to be friends with them? Do I like this person? Uh, And then over time, as you talk to them more, you make that analysis. You decide, okay, yeah, I want to be friends with this person. Or no, this person's really annoying. I don't want to be their friend. Um, My challenge to you today is to do that from the Bible, to do a biblical analysis of both the friends that you currently have, um, especially if you're in school, and the new friends that you're going to make, maybe in the spring semester. So let's start with the kind of friends we should have. I'm going to be reading a lot of verses. You don't have to turn to all of them. Um, I'll just read them, and then I'll tell you about it. So first, let's start with loyalty. Proverbs 17, 17. A friend is always loyal, and a brother is born to help in time of need. And in Proverbs 18, 24, there are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. A friend should be someone that always has your back, no matter what. No matter what problems you go through or what problems you cause, your friend is someone that's always with you. You can count on them, you can trust them, they're reliable, they're trustworthy, and I'll go through some more of these. But loyalty, in my opinion, is one of the biggest traits to look for when you're analyzing your friendships. Proverbs 17, 9, love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. Like I said during the last point, if you do something or if you say something, and we all do, we all make mistakes, a friend is not someone that casts you aside. If you apologize and you ask for forgiveness, a true friend is someone that's willing to forgive you and put that mistake out of their mind. John 15, 13, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus said this, uh, and I'll get more into this when I talk about the kind of friend that we should be to other people, but our friends should love us. If you have apathetic friends or friends that don't want to hang out with you or don't want to talk to you, especially when other people are around, that person is not a friend. If you want to know love in a friendship, look at 1 Samuel chapter 20. And Jonathan made David reaffirm his vow of friendship, for Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. If you want to know love in a friendship, that is the best chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 20. It talks about these two guys who are best of friends, and they love each other so much that they are willing to die. And that's how we should be to our friends, and our friends should love us as well. Proverbs 27, 6 Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. And Proverbs 27, 9, the heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. A true friend doesn't lie to you. A true friend can look you in the eyes and tell you the truth even when no one else is telling you the truth. When everyone else is lying to you and telling you things that you want to hear, a real friend is able to pull you aside and say, my friend, your haircut looks so bad and nobody's telling you. Nobody's telling you. Everybody's lying to you, but I'm willing to tell you the truth here. Look for friends that aren't afraid to speak the truth to you, not because they want to hurt you, but because they want to see you do better. And when I talk about doing better, I'm also talking about friends that challenge you. I'm not talking about challenging friendships. I'm talking about Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. A friend should be someone that challenges you to do better to be better, to act better. And they don't want you to stay stagnant and mundane. They want to see you succeed. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 10. 
Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. I say this to my friends, especially to those that are planning on going to grad school or wanting to do like bigger things. Your friends should want to see you succeed. Your friends should want to see you do better. They shouldn't be holding you back. They shouldn't be pulling you back, both outside in the world and in spiritual matters. Your friends should be pushing you to do better, to be better people. Inside of honesty, um, we also look at Ecclesiastes 4, verse 10. Uh, trustworthiness is another thing to remember. Galatians 6, 2, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. A friend is someone who is able to be honest with you and say, here are some things that I'm going through. Here are some problems that I'm having in my life. I don't need you to do anything, or I may not need you to do anything, but I need you to be there for me. I need you to listen. Proverbs 16, 28, a troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. A friend is someone who is honest to you about their burdens, but is also someone that you can be honest with about your burdens. You know that they're not going to tell 10 more people about it. Not just that kind of trustworthiness, but also a friend who's constant and reliable. <clears throat> In Ecclesiastes 4.10, we read, If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Ecclesiastes 4.12, A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Like I said before, you can trust them, you can rely on them to be there for you when you need them, whether that be in your highest of highs or in your lowest of lows, they trust you and you can trust them. And then chief among all, Psalms 119.63, I am a friend to anyone who fears you, anyone who obeys your commandments. If you wanna know what kind of believer friends you should have, that's that verse right there. Someone who fears God and obeys his commandments. Just because they're in church or go to every meeting or serve on every team does not mean that they meet those criteria. But if you get to know them and you see that they do fear God and they do listen to God's commandments and they obey them, then that's absolutely someone you should have as a friend. So that's the criteria that I wrote. Obviously, that's not everything. Um, but when you're analyzing your current friendships or your new friendships, uh, this is something to use as like a bookmark. Okay, so let's look at what kind of friends to not have. You might say to me, God calls us to be friends with everyone. No, he does not. Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. 1 Corinthians 13, 32 to 33, let's feast and drink for tomorrow we die. Don't be fooled by those who say such things for bad company corrupts good character. So clearly there are people that we as believers should not be friends with. One easy way to look at it is to look at the opposite of everything that we just said. So disloyal, unforgiving, unloving, dishonest, uninspiring, untrustworthy, not God-fearing. That's a good way to start. The opposite of everything that we just looked for is people that we should not be with. Psalms 1.1, 1, 1. oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. So there's three more right there. Wicked, sinners, mockers. Proverbs 22, 24. Don't befriend angry people or associate with hot-tempered people. This one's a little tough. Um, there's a lot of us that have this problem, myself included. Uh, I'll give you an anecdote. There was one time we were at an event, and this was a Malayali Pentecostal event. Uh, don't ask me what event it was, I won't say. <clears throat> We split up into groups, about 15 to 20 people, adults, children, men, women, everybody combined. And we were told to go around in the group and say one thing that we're currently struggling with. Every single person said anger issues. Every single person in the group. So this is clearly something that's very prevalent in our community. But let's look at why. Why does King Solomon say, don't associate with hot-tempered people? Look in the next verse. Or you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul. So this is something that's very serious. It's not only something to keep an eye on when we're selecting our friends, but also something to work on for ourselves. Um, I wanna talk about unbeliever friends. 
So there's a question inside of what kind of friends to have or to not have that involves friendship with unbelievers. Um, you may hear James 4.4 4 talked about, uh, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Um, you may be told that you can't be friends with unbelievers. I disagree with that, and I'll explain why. Um, but there is a biblical approach to this that I would like to put before you that you can use when analyzing your friendships. Um, we have to find the line between two seemingly opposite commands. So one side says, bad company corrupts good character. Um, a little uh, Sin is like a little yeast that spreads throughout the whole batch of dough. I will say that verse is more talking about inside of the church. Um, walk with the wise, become wise, associate with fools, get in trouble. And Psalms 1.1, don't follow the advice of the wicked, stand around with sinners, join in with mockers. So you have all these commandments and all these wisdom proverbs on one side that say, watch out, hanging out with corrupt people can lead to your, corrupt, cor your corruption. But on the other side, we have Jesus, who not only ate with tax collectors and sinners, but he did so so much that he got the label that he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And you've got Paul saying, what I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin, but I wasn't talking about unbelievers. You would have to leave this world to associate people, to not associate with people like that. He doesn't mean don't associate with those who are greedy or those who cheat people or worship idols because you would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. Paul is with Jesus in saying, no, you're going to be thrown in with all these people. You're going to work with them. You're going to be in school with them. You should take opportunities. You should become all things to all people in a biblical way. So there's two sets of admonitions, and we have to discern which one to apply when. Um, so I would say you ask these two questions. The first one is, which way is a transforming influence flowing? When you are with someone, are you being transformed or are they being transformed? Are you being drawn to minimize the value of holiness? Have your standards been compromised by who you hang out with? Are you being made callous and, and, and hard toward things, say, in, in movies or on television or in language that you weren't once callous to, that you were sensitive to? So that's the first question. Who's influencing who? The second question is, are we loving these people for their sake? That is, that, that they would come to the faith and that they would become godly? Or do we really love them because we love what they enjoy and we really just like being with them in their worldliness? I think a lot of people justify hanging out with worldly people because they are worldly Christians and they feel at home with worldly Christians, and the things that they laugh at, they don't find offensive. The things that they watch in movies, they don't regard as a problem. The language that they use, they don't think it's a big deal. The way that they spend their time, that's the way that they want to spend their time, which really shows that they're not loving these people with a Christ-like love that's ready to die, to change their behavior and change their patterns. They're merely just conforming to them and then calling it love. So those are the two questions that I think will help navigate between bad company corrupts good morals on one hand and, and Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners on the other hand is to see which way is the transforming influence flowing and do you want to be with them because you want to do the things that they do or are you really hoping that they will find Christ, that they will find the light? My last topic, what kind of friend we should have? That answer is easy. Is like Jesus. Jesus was and continues to be the greatest friend. He loved us to the point of death. He wasn't afraid to call out his own best friends when they got out of line. He supported and encouraged and pushed them and made some of the most important people ever to live. They were just regular fishermen before that. Jesus gave us the perfect blueprint on how to be a good friend to other people. I read this verse earlier, John 15, 13. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. What are the two most important commandments that Jesus tells us? The first one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second one is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. That's how we should be to others, not just our friends or people that we want to be friends, but to people in general. We should love them, truly love them. 
Uh, worship team, you can come forward. But if I may leave you with this, how can you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself if you hate yourself? And I think that's something that's very prevalent not only in the world, but we have to be real in our church as well. There are people that struggle with that. You can't love your neighbor as much as you love yourself if you hate yourself. So you have to start with one, loving God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and ask him to help you love yourself, then love your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, but you hate yourself, you're going to burn out. God loves you. So why would you hate yourself? You're not unlovable. God loves you very much. He loves you so much he was willing to die for you. So love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. Be very careful who you surround yourself with. Friendships are very difficult, but they do determine a big part of your life. Be the light that God calls us to be. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for giving us this opportunity to come before your presence, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, for giving us this time. I pray that you would help us, Lord, in work and in school as we go out into the world. Please help us, God, to be shining lights for you in this world, Lord God. Please help us, God, to be reflections of you, to love others the way that you love us, to treat others the way that we would want to be treated, to think of others as better than ourselves, Lord, to be more like you in everything that we do and everything that we say, God. Pray that people would see Christ in us, Lord. I thank you, God, and in your name I pray. Amen. Amen.